Great. So the last talk for this uh, session is by Diana Zernich on regret minimization with performative feedback. Thank you. Um, so just before I start, I want to give a disclaimer. I might cough during my talk, but it's a chronic cough condition and it's nothing contagious. So it's not COVID. <laughs> um, okay. So again, my name is Tiana, and today I'll be talking about um, a recent joint work with Nina Jagadizan, who's also a PhD student at Berkeley, and myself, Miller Dunner, who's a research group lead at Max Planck Institute. Um, yeah, so I want to start with a diagram of how I think we usually think about prediction. So um, when we think about prediction, usually we have the following five parts in mind. We collect some data about the world to be able to make predictions about the world. But in reality, we rarely make predictions just for prediction's sake, but rather we typically make predictions to inform some kind of decision making. Um, and these decisions that we make are often consequential for the world around us. Um, and as such, they feed back into it and alter its state in some way. Um, and so why do we care about this feedback loop as machine learning researchers? Well, when predictions support decisions, they will alter the distribution of future observations that we use for inference. Um, and I'll mention that this feedback between decisions in the world is largely ignored by supervised learning. And in the context of supervised learning, it will be treated as some kind of uh, nuisance distribution shift. So in this talk, I will refer to such predictions that feed into decisions and thus feed back into the world and alter its state as uh, performative predictions. Um, and so now I'd like to make the point that these performative predictions are actually pervasive. Um, and to do so, I will give three different examples from pretty different problem domains. So this first example is really any kind of setting where we observe strategic behavior. This particular figure uh, comes from a social welfare program that was implemented in Colombia in the early 90s. So in particular, the Colombian government came up with a scoring system that would assign each household in Colombia a so-called poverty index score. And then households that were below um, a critical threshold in terms of their score would be eligible for uh, certain subsidies. And so at the beginning when this score was implemented, uh, the score distribution looked like something on the top left. And then over time, the score distribution slowly started drifting. And a few years later, one could actually observe a sharp discontinuity right at this critical threshold that would make you eligible for subsidies. And then a few years later, the score pretty much became meaningless because most households were below this critical threshold. So what happened here was that the mechanism of how this score was computed started leaking, and people could deterministically just gain the scoring rule and draw below this uh, critical threshold. So here we can see that it was the act of deployment of the scoring rule that induced this shift in the distribution of the scores themselves. Um, another example is traffic predictions. So let's say I'm in Berkeley, I'm trying to get to the DMV office in Oakland, um, I will pull up my phone, open an app, I will check the predicted travel times along different possible routes. Um, and in my case in particular, I will usually just pick the fastest route. But then obviously, if everybody driving from Berkeley to Oakland at the same time is thinking the same way as me, then the route that was estimated to be the fastest could, in a kind of self negating prophecy, end up being the slowest one because all of us will decide to take the same route. So here again, we can see that we're making some prediction in terms of the travel time, but the realized travel time could be biased uh, as a result of all of us making these collective decisions. And as a final example, uh, social scientists have uh, observed that a similar phenomenon occurs um, in the context of election forecasts. So um, in particular, if uh, a presidential candidate is predicted to uh, win by a landslide, then it was observed that that could actually disincentivize the supporters of that candidate to go out and vote uh, because they simply think the election is a done deal. Um, and so what could happen here is that as a result of this low voter turnout, the realized outcome of an election could actually end up being flipped relative to what was uh, originally forecasted. Um, and again, we see that we have this self-negating prophecy because the prediction itself is what drove the uh, realized outcome of the election. Um, and so now I want to set this problem up a little bit more formally. Unfortunately, you can't see the names, um, but I'll do so in a framework that we developed together with Fronky, who's also here at the conference, uh, Celestine and Warren Hart. 
a couple of years ago when we called this framework uh, performative prediction. And I think it's easiest to set up performative prediction in contrast with just standard supervised learning. So um, in supervised learning, um, we usually think of data as consisting of feature outcomes, feature outcome pairs that are distributed according to some fixed unknown distribution D. And our target is usually to minimize some form of risk where the risk is just the expected loss over this distribution D. And so here I'm using this um, LZ theta notation to denote the loss incurred by uh, predicting with some parametric model uh, theta on an instance. So throughout, I'll be assuming um, a parametric setup. In performative prediction, on the other hand, we do not assume that there is any one fixed data distribution, but rather we assume that each potential predictive model F theta could imply a possibly distinct distribution D of theta over observations. And we call this key object in the framework, the distribution map. And so now if we think about what's the most natural counterpart of risk minimization and supervised learning, then arguably that would be define minimizers of the performative risk, where now the performative risk of a model theta is again defined as the expected loss of model theta, but we're looking at the distribution that will be induced by the deployment. So here we see this double dependence of data um, in the objective. And so now if we think about an extreme case where the performative effects are so weak that they are essentially non-existent, um, that would mean that this distribution map is just a constant map. So you can think of it as being equal to D for all theta. And in that case, uh, minimizers of the performative risk would just be uh, standard supervised risk minimizers. Okay, and so now the caveat here is that this distribution map D of theta will typically be unknown ahead of time. So if we're implementing some kind of traffic forecasting system, then hardly can we predict the distribution of travel times before we actually deploy the system. So we'll assume that this distribution D of theta is unknown unless we actually uh, deploy a model theta in the first place. Um, and note that because we don't know this D of theta, that means that the learner needs to essentially deploy different potential models theta in order to explore the landscape of this map D of theta. Um, and so given that this is an online task, it is only natural to evaluate an online sequence of deployments, theta one through theta t, via what we call performative regret. So that is just the cumulative sum of differences between the performative risk that will be actually induced by the deployment and the best possible uh, performative risk that we can achieve. So now we've agreed that our goal is to find a sequence of deployments, theta one through theta t, such that uh, this performative uh, regret quantity is small. So now let's think about what kind of online learning task this is. So clearly it's an online learning problem, but what properties does it satisfy? Or rather, what challenges uh, come with this problem? The first one is that we don't have gradient access to our objective. So um, if you write down the gradient of this performative risk quantity, you will see one term that is nice. So it looks like standard gradient terms that we would usually see in the context, um, in the context of uh, context optimization. But we see that we have an extra term that depends on essentially knowledge of the distribution. So here for simplicity, I'm assuming that uh, each distribution D of theta has some density and I'm denoting that density by uh, P theta. So the problem here is that this P theta function is unknown ahead of time. So we actually can't explicitly compute this gradient of log um, so that's one difficulty. The other difficulty is that we don't have any kind of guarantee of convexity of our objective, even if the loss function is convex. So recall that this is the definition of performative risk. And so now, even if this inner uh, function LZ theta is a convex function of theta, we have this extra dependence on theta that comes through the distribution map. And so this extra dependence on theta could actually break uh, our uh, convexity. And so I'll mention that it is still possible to prove convexity under uh, certain conditions. So um, uh, some conditions are given by Don Groff, Tristan Wagner, and Wu in 2018. And last year, also in a joint work 
for John Miller and Juan Padova, we did some complementary conditions. But I'll mention that all of these conditions are pretty restrictive, they're pretty specific. Um, and also, roughly speaking, they will require that the performative effects, so the strength of the feedback is relatively weak. So in general, we can't really expect for this objective to be convex, even if the loss function L is convex. Okay, so now let's review the challenges. First of all, we said we don't have radiant access. Then we said we don't have convexity. So now it's really natural to just say, well, isn't this just some kind of continuum arm bandit problem? And this is not gonna be far from the truth as I will elaborate in a minute. But for now, I just want to clarify that by a continuum arm bandit problem, I mean something of the sort at every time step T, I pull an arm theta T and I observe a noisy reward ER hat and theta T that is an unbiased estimate of the performative risk uh, at the pulled arm. But what we show in this work, like our starting observation was really that performative settings actually exhibit fundamentally richer feedback than banded feedback. And we can use this fundamentally richer feedback to get better algorithms. So in particular, what I mean by richer feedback is that we actually observe samples that will be induced by the deployment and not just feedback about the reward. So if I collect samples from D of theta T, that is sufficient for me to give you a PR hat estimate, but I can actually do a lot more. And I will illustrate what I can do in the following couple of slides. But for now, I'll just say that this allows us to design algorithms for finding optimal points that will require less exploration than standard off-the-shelf banded baselines. Um, and this is really the key insight. The key insight is to construct tighter confidence bounds. So these standard banded baselines, the way they work is they will construct confidence bounds on the reward of unexplored uh, arms. So in particular, this would be an illustration of how these banded baselines work. Uh, we have our reward function that is unknown. That's our performative risk function. Usually we will assume that it's slip shape. So we said that this is a continuum arm banded problem. Unless you impose some kind of regularity, this is really an unsolvable problem. So the usual way to work around um, this arm space being continuous is to just impose a Lipschitz condition on the average reward. So now we deploy some model data. We observe a noisy estimate of PR at that point. And maybe for some point that we haven't previously explored the data new, we're wondering, okay, can I say something about the performative risk at this new point? So then what these baselines will do is they will say, well, okay, given that I know that my objective is Lipschitz, the more I move away from the point that I previously deployed, my uncertainty about the reward of this new point grows. And so in this particular example, this would be a confidence region where we can say, okay, the certainty, the performative risk of this new point is in this region right here. What we observe that we can do with performative feedback is something like the following. So we're in the same kind of setting. We've deployed one model and we're wondering, okay, what can I say about the risk of a new point? Well, we show that you can actually trace out the shape of the loss much more closely. Um, and in this particular example, this would, for example, our, be our um, confidence region for the risk of an unexplored arm. And just to give a little bit of technical intuition for why this happens. So if we write down the difference between the performative risk at the new point and the performative risk at the old point, so this is what it is just by definition, and so now I'll add and subtract the term. So uh, I added and subtracted the term, which is equal to the loss of the new model on the distribution that was previously induced. So now I have a sum of two differences. This first difference is essentially the uncertainty due to distribution shift. So in the first difference, I'm keeping the model inside the loss fixed and I'm changing the distribution. And the second difference is the uncertainty due to changing the predictive model. So what I'm doing here is that I'm keeping the distribution fixed, but I'm changing the predictive model inside the loss. And so now if you think about it, if I collect samples, so if I have some reasonably good estimate of this distribution at theta deployed, then I don't really need to upper bound this second difference. I can just evaluate it exactly because I know the loss 
because the loss is my choice uh, as, uh, as a designer. So I really only need to pay for bounding this first step right here. I only need to pay for the uncertainty of the distribution shift. I shouldn't really have to pay for the uncertainty um, in, due to changing the predictive model. So that is some basic intuition. And so slightly more formally, this is the kind of theorem that we can prove. So if this distribution map P of theta is absolute Lipschitz and the loss is Lipschitz in Z, then there exists an algorithm that after key deployments will get the following red right bound, where you can see the dependence on some kind of D. So D is something that's uh, typically referred to as the zooming dimension. I'm not going to define formally what zooming dimension is. All I will say is that in the worst case, it's equal to the dimension of the theta space. But essentially, if your objective has a lot of curvature, then it can be a lot smaller. So it's an instance dependent notion of dimension that kind of captures how much curvature your objective has. Um, and so just to contrast this with what would be a standard black box standard bound. So this is what you would get. If you think about it, it looks kind of similar. So there's again some kind of zooming dimension. I'm intentionally denoting it by prime here. And it depends on the Lipschitz constant of the whole objective of PR. And so now if we look at these two side by side, we can see that with performative feedback, we can make a couple of different improvements over this black box solution. So one is that we do not have to constrain the loss as a function of theta in any way. So in this black box bound, we need to know that the overall reward distribution is Lipschitz. And so that will implicitly constrain the loss as a function of theta in a way, but we do not have to constrain that objective at all. Another improvement is that if we let the performative effects go to zero, so if we say, okay, we're in some kind of environment that's actually not reactive at all, so that would correspond to taking this epsilon parameter to zero, then our regret rate won't have any dimension in that. So it would just be root t due to this um, finite sample uncertainty. Whereas this black box bound will still have an exponential uh, dimension dependence. And then finally, the notion of zooming dimension that we get with performative feedback will always be no larger than the zooming dimension that we would get with this uh, black box solution. Um, okay, so just to quickly wrap up. So we started from this observation that when predictions support decisions, they may change the distribution over future observations. Um, and we said that uh, how the distribution changes is typically unknown ahead of time. We actually have to make the deployment to see how the distribution shifts. And so that means that the learner needs to deploy models in an online fashion in order to find one with low induced risk. And so that allowed us to formulate this problem of regret minimization with performative feedback. And we saw that it's kind of similar to a bandit problem, but it has a slightly richer feedback structure. Um, what we showed in this work is that with performative feedback, we actually require less exploration to find a good solution relative to uh, solutions that just use bandage feedback. And finally, this allowed us to design algorithms that have regret and scales only with the complexity of the distribution shifts and not the complexity of the performative function. Um, yeah, and yeah, I thank you for listening. And I'm just